All right, good morning, everybody. Okay, so as a quick way of reviewing, we, we talked about a lot pertaining to who we are, and we first discussed that our desires need to be set upon God. We discussed how as we receive God's sanctifying and reconciling love, we have an identity in the relationship with God, right? And in that relationship, our identity is secure. We have the whole of what we need to be, right? In that relationship with Jesus Christ, we have it all. Uh, the passage in Colossians specifically and explicitly said, he is your life, all of it, right? Now, what that translates to and how it expresses itself is that we should be marked by as, as a people of great gratitude, right? An incredible thankfulness where we're so thankful that we're not weak to the temptations and allurements of the world, and neither are we weak to the fears of our desire to preserve ourselves, right? So thankful, we're not weak to that stuff. Rather, we can say, I am actually well-nourished, I'm fine. It's not that those things are okay, it's just that I'm actually okay. I'm fine, right? Today, we're specifically going to talk about this, that as your identi identity in Christ becomes more clear, it becomes more solidified, and the foundation of who you are becomes all the more stable, then you need to identify yourself as such, right? Meaning, as your identity becomes clearer and clearer, it should come out. People will notice that your identity is more focused. It's narrow on Christ, and it's also full on Christ. And what I'm going to say is, not only should it be the case, you absolutely have to identify yourself. By nature of certain identities you hold, you have to speak. Simple example is yesterday, uh, one of the evenings, there was a you know, stroller with a very, very cute baby, okay? And the baby was so cute, sleeping and so calm, I just stopped and kind of stared at the baby, right? And obviously, my first question is, hmm, whose baby is this, right? Just a short, simple example. By nature of the fact of certain relationship, your role as a parent, if somebody asks, whose cute baby is this? You have to identify yourself. That's my baby, right? That's my baby. Otherwise... Like, it would be really, really awkward. It's like, oh my goodness, we have a baby lost. It. <laughs> Whose baby is it? And you're just kind of waiting, like, I hope they find me. You know, like, it's just not going to happen that way. The point is really clear. Once your identity is solidified, once your identity is clear, you have to speak up. Now, in thinking about this, I entitled this sermon, Down to Speak of Christ. Okay, Down to Speak of Christ. And... Each one of those words is going to matter to our thought today. My point primarily is this, right? That as Christ is your identity, and that as he is so important to you, you must speak to the degree that if you recall, it was Christ who said, therefore, if anybody confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. However, if anybody denies me, I will deny him to my Father who is in heaven. That comes from Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. There is not only a should, but there is a necessity that you would speak up of your greatest relationship, of your greatest identity. And just as it is appropriate in the relationship of father and child, it is relationship, in that specific relationship of such a high priority relationship, you must speak of Christ. If you recall, please turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. This is one of the passages that we read before. And sometimes I talked about how Apostle Paul, when he speaks, it feels like, okay, it feels like Apostle Paul is going on a tangential or he goes on some, you know, side note of how great Christ is. He goes on doxologies. Sometimes he does that. However, in the book of Colossians, I said, you know what? The whole part of it, it it's actually one whole thought. Christ is everything. Yes? And everything is being reconciled through Christ. So guess what? You as a focal point, you need to be in Christ. In him, in him, in him, in him, in him. 
Well, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, look at what Apostle Paul says about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Meaning, Christ is supposed to have preeminence in all. In the church, in individual lives, in your heart, in every arena of existence, Christ is supposed to have preeminence. He is supposed to be your prize, your treasure, your love, your leader, your hope, first priority. Right? So, just a moment ago, I gave the example of Aaron's baby, you know, who again, I didn't know the backstory, so I was just like looking at the baby, thinking, so cute, looking around the room thinking, huh, I don't see the connection, right? Now, the relationship between son, father, son, mother, one of the strongest relationships we know as a human being, yes? That relationship takes priority over so many other relationships in life. Appropriate example for this, Christ is saying that in terms of priority, importance and significance and weight of the matter, Christ is preeminent, yes? Okay. Then the next point to that is, then you better be down for that relationship. I'm going to read to you a passage. Jot this down as a reference. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. This is one of those verses that when I was a young Christian, I read, and it absolutely transformed my life life. This is what he says, okay? First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Jot it down. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Okay, let me repeat this. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Christ is preeminent over all, then set him apart as preeminent over your heart right? What does it mean to sanctify Christ? Is to make sure that he is not like every other passion you have. You dare not compare the passion you have for your son or your child or your wife or anybody who is important to you, like your passion for the Lakers, for Dodgers, or whoever else you love, okay? You dare not put that on the same par. Likewise, this passage is telling you, set Christ as preeminent in your heart. And if you do so, you better be down. You better be ready to make a defense. I just mentioned to you, when I was young, I just had this simple mentality. I was a new Christian. It's a young boy. So everything had to do with just like fighting or something, right? So in my mind, I was like, yeah. I read this and I was amped. I was like, that's right. He's my Lord. You ready? Like I was ready to fight, you know? Like that's how I took it. Like I better be ready to defend my God. I better give an account, an answer, an apology, whatever it was. I'm going to be ready. And I was just, I was totally amped. And then later as I was, you know, growing and different stages of life, I got married. And I started thinking about a different example. Ready to make a defense for the one that I've set apart in my heart. I started thinking about my wife, you know. Now, how many of you dudes in here have had hero fantasies? You know what I'm talking about for hero fantasies? Maybe it's like damsel in distress, girl you like, wife, girlfriend, whoever it is. Start fantasizing and daydreaming. Or she's in trouble, you know? She's like out there maybe just doing her thing, shopping, whatever it is. And some creepy dude, some creepy old like 50-year-old guy come up to like, wow, young lady, you're really pretty, you know? And he's just making moves and making it all crazy awkward. And all of a sudden, the guy gets, you know, he, he breaks the boundary. And he starts actually coming close to her, trying to talk to her. And then let's say he gets all touchy. Like, hey, come here, take a photo with me, right? And then this is when the hero fantasy comes in. Let's say the guy was getting even more, like, un- inappropriate, right? And then you have the hero fantasy where you're just like, hey, man. What are you doing? You get over there like, <laughs> no, you guys don't. All right, I guess I'm. 
Hero fan, you guys all have hero fantasies. You save the day, right? And then you even have some fool on the side. It's like, oh man, who's that guy? I'm her husband. You know, like you come in there and now within that whole scenario, now I'm being all trying to be all funny and stuff like that, but it, it all makes sense. But ladies, would you be proud of your man? Right? Would you be proud of your man if he sat there? He's watching this whole thing. He's seeing the creepiness go down. And all of a sudden, rather than jumping in, he's just kind of like, well, you know, scripture says you got to turn the other cheek. You know, like, <laughs> you got to love him first, right? W- what if your man did that? Would you be like, so proud of you, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that was amazing. Now, let me give you another funny example of this, how ridiculous this can get. How would you feel if, if not only if your man didn't jump in and identify himself like, I'm her husband, she's mine, right? But instead, I sat there and I happened to actually be next, let's say it was a family event or something like that. And I was actually with her father, Mr. Park. And rather than jumping in, I just sat there and said, you know, would you mind stepping in? He's like closer to your age, you know? (laughs) Would you mind stepping in and like just, just resolve the situation? Now, it's just a funny example, but I don't know how many times Christians made the excuse of like, but he's an older man. I don't think I could talk to him. To defend your savior? To speak for your Christ? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that's your identity. You have every right to jump in there and let me make it even more convicting. God does that for us. See, his, he says, I am a jealous God for you. I am so jealous, and it's not a wicked, evil thing. I'm jealous because our relationship identifies that I'm yours and you're mine. So if there's another idol, if there's another nation, I jump in and say, these people are mine. You bear my mark. And for us, we have to at least reciprocate with the mentality that says, God is my God and my love. He's preeminent in my heart. So if stuff goes down, if people attack my Savior, I'm down. For his glory, his honor, I'm down to speak up right? When your identity becomes all the more clear, you will identify yourself and speak. That's what I'm talking about. But I will confess, because sometimes that foundation isn't that clear. You're just wondering, like, should I say something? Should I not say something? Is it my place to jump in? Is it my place to jump in if her father is here? Is it my? We overthink that way too much. Of course it is, right? If I'm her husband, of course, in a moment's notice, I should be the first one in there, right between them. You need to go through me first, right? This is the privilege we have as Christians to identify ourselves. I'm God's, right? He's mine. I'm his. And that's my identity. Now, as I say this then, we have great examples in the book of Colossians of how down disciples of Christ can be. Apostle Paul is down, right? He's down to go, he's down to speak, he's down to minister. He's down to do ministry. Turn your Bibles, Colossians chapter 1, starting from verse 24. We read this passage before, but now I'm highlighting how down Apostle Paul is, okay? Think about how down he is. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. He's down to suffer. Not only is he down, he thinks it's a point of rejoicing. He thinks like, oh my goodness, I have the unique honor to suffer for you, right? And he says, and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been made manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we proclaim him, we admonish every man, teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, I strive according to his power, which mightily works within me. 
For I want you to know, listen, he says, I want you to know how down I am, how great a struggle I have on your behalf for those who are in Laodicea, for all those who are not, I have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Did you catch that? Apostle Paul, when he heard, when he himself heard the word, he recognized, this is the mystery of God revealed to us. And I know our glory is in Christ. And then so what happens? He's down. He's down to labor, strive, suffer, teach. He's down to minister to the people he's never seen. He's writing letters. He's sending other messengers. He's doing everything he can. So, there is an immediate question for you. The clarity of your identity is going to express itself in how down you are for that cause, for that identity, right? Now, in order to highlight this even more, just remember that Apostle Paul talks about his, okay, I'm just using that word, right, how down he is, but he also refers to Christ, about Christ's suffering. So we have to use Christ as the example. You know that Jesus was so down. But my point is why? If there was anybody who knew exactly what we were talking about this weekend, it was Jesus. Jesus knew God loved him. Right? Do you recall in the Gospels, Jesus regularly, regularly identifies that. God regularly identifies that. This is my son, who I am very pleased. Right? This is my son, listen to him, right? Why? Because I am very pleased in him. Jesus regularly says, I am in the Father, he is in me, we are one. He loves me, I love the Father, and he says, I have come down to do his will. Listen to this, John 6, 37 through 40. Okay, John 6, 37 through 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Why? For I have come down from heaven. Okay, he's literally down. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing. I raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. That's what he says. What's more, later on, actually earlier on, John 4, 34, he says, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not even know of. And the disciples asked, saying, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? They were asking, like, what? He's got food? How come he's not sharing with us? No one brought him anything. How come he has food? And then he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. Right? This is my food. This is what I live on. Doing the will of God. Quick challenge to you. Some of us, perhaps, are perhaps just sitting and waiting, wondering, like, what does God want me to do? You know? Good question. It's not wrong to ask. You should wrestle with that stuff. Some of us, however, are overthinking the issue. Like, oh, does this fit me? Does this da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da? Just simply ask yourself, like, what is the expressed will of God? Right? What is God's vision? What is his desire for you, for the church at large, for his kingdom, for the people? And once you realize it, just know every single aspect of God's will is going to be food for you. And therefore, by your identity, you should be able to say, this is my desire, this is my value, and I'm absolutely willing to do the will of the Father. Because that was my identity, and for that, I'm down. Right? Now, moving forward, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you down for ministry? Right? Are you down for ministry? Now, in Colossians, Apostle Paul describes various aspects of the ministry that we should all be down for. I just mentioned right now, what is the will of God? What can we attach ourselves to and say, this is my purpose, right? Well, look with me in Colossians chapter 3. So take a moment to flip your Bibles over there. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and down. 
12 through about 17. Okay. And what he said was, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Right? This is the perfect bond of unity. Are you down to bear the burden of loving the guy next to you? Are you down to bear the burden of loving the person sitting right by you? Truthfully speaking, sometimes people think ministry is, I don't know, teaching from the pulpit. Ministry is organizing and having a, some kind of title and being like in a certain position. That's not the case. The one on others is ministry. And what's going to be super encouraging to you, all your leaders at church is when they see you, just look to the guy next to you and start ministering to them by knowing them, loving them, and just caring for them. When you take the initiative, can I, you know, just want to find out how you're doing. You want to grab boba? Let's talk. The moment you do that, all of your leaders' hearts are filled with encouragement. They're just like so thankful. Why? You're doing their work, right? You're sharing the burden of caring for the souls of the church. That's ministry. Are you down for that? Some of you guys, you don't need a certain niche. Should I join praise team? I don't know. Can you sing? Like, you can just try out for all that kind of stuff, but every single individual is given a very explicit will of God. You carry the burden of loving the person next to you. Secondly, turn over to Colossians 4, verse 2 and 6. Colossians 4, verse 2 and 6. Look at what he says. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at all times for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. If you thought ministry meant being a pastor, being a missionary, elder, deacon, understand that ministry is prayer, right? Ministry is loving the person next to you. Ministry is your regular prayer, going to God, asking for the Spirit's conviction, asking for the Spirit's growth, asking for all the stuff of remembrance of truth, remembrance of, of all that Christ said, growing and moving, all of that. Every single prayer lifted up to God. Every single moment you go to God and ask for the Spirit to move, that's ministry, right? Is that something you need a title for? Is that something you need to find a niche for? No, it is not. It is the will of God that in every season you pray, that in all supplication, no matter what it is, you will lift up prayers to the Lord. Okay, now moving forward. With all that said, notice the content right there in chapter 4 of what you should be praying for. Notice the content of all of that. And I go back to this point, okay? So the very first point, again, was that, um, you know, <clears throat> If your identity is clear, then you will speak. Then I said Christ is preeminent over all. I said then you must be down, right? If, that, if, that, if Christ is priority, then you must be down. You must be down to then love. You must be down then to pray, okay? It's kind of outline we've been following. But now I must say this. Within this ministry, then you must be down to speak. Actually confess with your mouth and speak of Christ. You, by definition, have been called a witness by the Bible. Yes? You are a first-hand witness with the story. If you are a Christian, you are an individual with a story to tell. That is, by definition, what you are because God has worked in your life. And what needs to happen is you need to speak of the goodness of God. You need to speak of the glories of Christ. You need to speak of all that he's done for you. How he has filled you, how he has commissioned you, 
Everything that Christ is to you, you need to be able to speak. And the more clarity you have, the greater you will be able to speak. And that's why when you look back at this passage, think about what he says. He says, be alert, be sober, be devoted to prayer. And as you pray, pray for the open door. And then he talks about himself and he says, pray that I may speak clearly. You need to speak clearly. As an example, I've been using my wife as a lot of examples. I'm going to do it again, okay? Mainly because every time I sit down and then I tell people, oh, I got a family, and I show you a picture, and they're like, oh, cute, you know? The first question is like, how did you and your wife meet, right? Because you want to hear the story. Where did you guys meet? Now imagine if you asked me, like, where did you guys meet? And I was like, oh, well, where did we meet? Uh, it's just kind of always knew she was there. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. So, but at some point, you might have been friends, but you guys like kind of like, who had interest first? You're like, ah, that's complicated, you know? Like, I kind of, nah, she was her. I think it was her. You're like, okay. So then, you know, when you guys dated, what was it like? And then you're like, well, that's complicated too, because we dated for like 12 years, right? And we were off and on. Sometimes it was serious. Sometimes it wasn't serious. There were times I didn't talk to her much. And then later, right now, we're like pretty serious. And you're like, but I thought you were married. Right? Like, like, how did you propose? Like, did you, did you propose? Did you like, you know, set up a, a, a table with flowers? And did you, you know, get down on one knee? And then I'm like, Oz. Do you really have to ask? I've actually had to sat down with people when I talk about their testimony. And I asked them, have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you? And they asked in return, do you have to? If you don't have a story, I don't know how you can say you're married. Right? When you're... When your relationship is clear, you should be able to say, you know what, I remember distinctly, you know, I just saw her and I was like, wow, you know, like, it was amazing. I could see nothing but her, you know. Now, it might not have to be as dramatic. And maybe it was a slow development. You know what, we were friends for a while and I didn't know how, how beautiful she was until, well, that could be your story, right? It makes sense. But the more clear your relationship is with Christ, the more clear you're able to tell the story. And that is your Christian life when it comes to evangelism. You're not trying to wax eloquently about how the world works. I hate it when people get into this trap. They're trying to evangelize. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, in theology, the reason why evil actually exists. and when this, uh, Like, dude, that is, that's not what God, God did not tell you. I've given you wisdom of my counsel so that you can tell the story of how the universe is standing, right? God said, no, I worked in your life so you can tell people how good I am. I gave you grace so that you can tell people how much I love you and how much they could, they could experience this love in me. You have this story, and that's your identity. Speak of it. And if you can't, I challenge, I challenge you. If you have one of these stories where somebody asks you, like, oh, like, when did you become Christian? And you say, like, well, my whole family went to church all our lives, and I always knew he was there. Hold up. Hold up. Reevaluate that. Think through that. Is that the Christian gospel? Is that how marriage works? Is that how a reconciled relationship, remember, kingdom of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of light. You go from death to life, and then you're like, somewhere along the way it happened, man. <laughs> I'm not sure you can say that. So your, your story must be clear. You need to be able to say, man, God has been good to me, and this is how it's happened. Now notice in Colossians, going back, right? In Colossians chapter 4, this passage, he says, I want to make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And then he talks about how he says, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of every, every opportunity. And then he talks about your speech. Let your speech always be with grace. Let it be seasoned with salt so that you know how you should respond to everyone, to each person individually. I'm going to summarize that by saying, wow, that sounds like a person who has great proficiency and confidence. Speak with confidence. You need to speak with clarity, and you need to speak with confidence when it comes to you and God. 
right? You need to speak with confidence. Now, let me tell you this, okay? Give me a bad example. There are times, unfortunately, I think when I was a young Christian in my college days, I'm going to confess, I was an arrogant, bombastic guy. So I would get in fights with like verbal arguments with older people and stuff like that. When I see scripture and it says, have courage, speak with boldness, I had this kind of at mentality. It's like, yeah, right? Now, I never said this, but I'm just giving you a bad example. Some people think confidence means that you say the tough stuff and you say it to their face, right? So and I got Stephanie here. It's a sweet young lady, but I need to be bold. So I'm like, you're going to hell, right? I said it because it needed to be said, right? Like, and then she's like, oh, what? Like, okay, I believe there's a hell. Let's say she's not a Christian. She's like, I believe there's a hell. Okay, I believe there's a heaven. I believe there's a hell. I believe there's goodness and justice and God has to differentiate. But why am I going to hell, right? And I'm sitting there like, why well, ask why when you're going to hell, right? Like, some people think confidence means you say the hard stuff and you just repeat it. You see, when people think volume, repetition, and being in your face is confidence, they're actually overcompensating for a lack of confidence. When someone is really confident, they know what they're talking about. They have a clarity and understanding. This is the truth. And therefore, they can be gracious with it. Does that make sense? And the confidence comes not just because of the knowledge, but there's two parts to this. The confidence comes from your clarity of understanding and your trust. And for us as Christians, the, the trust is in the person of God, in the wisdom of his truth, the power of his gospel, the character of his personhood, his sovereignty, his ability to work all things for the good, right? For the non-Christian, they take confidence in clarity and trust in themselves. I understand this, I trust my knowledge, right? But for you, God says your identity in Christ and your confidence in the Lord should be strong, that you are able to speak with grace, you're, be, you're able to be seasoned with salt, and you know how to respond to each person. I want to conclude by saying, remember earlier, I said there was a passage that was so important, which is 1 Peter chapter 3.15. Reading it again, it says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. Today, the challenge is, if your identity is clear, you will have an account. You're not making it up. You're not trying to make it more fluffy. You have an account. And that account is already golden. Not because of your wisdom, because just the simple fact of who you have in Christ, right? And so I want to challenge you. Do not let your identity sit, sit, waiting for someone to expose it for you. Your clear identity will speak for itself. Amen? Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much again. God, it is an amazing, amazing truth to think about that you, Lord, will claim to know us. Father God, to be known by you is an incredible privilege. Father Lord, to be considered, to be thought of and cared for by you is an incredible privilege. And we want to thank you so much for that. And God, as we've been talking about this and learning from the scriptures, I pray, Father Lord, that we will reciprocate what you have done in our lives. God, by making sure we will confess, Lord, we will not be ashamed of being identified by the name of Christ. Help us, Father God, to recognize that that is the most powerful name. And I ask God that for every single individual here who struggles with fear, who struggles with doubt, whatever it may be, would you grant to them the clarity of your love that, God, they might be able to speak in thankfulness of all the glories of Christ. Lord, we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.